The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 16 Good evening all. Uh, I hope you are all doing fabulously well uh, and that you are enjoying uh, the summer weather, if you've got summer weather, and that you are managing to stay dry if you've got rain and that you are staying warm if you're in the Southern Hemisphere and it's cold. So, um, I'd just like to say a big hello to the many listeners the world over. Um, uh, We're now up to 29 countries around the world that are listening into this stuff, and thousands of listeners on Spotify and Apple and... Uh, Google Podcasts and Deezer and Stitcher and TuneIn Radio and everywhere else that I posted all this stuff. Hello, Yuta Sunday at last indeed. You are completely right. I'm just going to give it a couple of seconds for various people to to realise that uh, this is happening if they want to join. I won't rush it, but uh, do, um, if you're, wherever you're listening to this, if you're listening to this on Giggle Fix, if you're listening to this on The Bearded Wit, if you're listening to this on Ninja Thinking, and if you're listening to this on Licking Toads, hello, one and all, uh, give me a shout, uh, post a hello, say good evening, um, or good morning, or good night depending on where you are in the world, uh, whatever is appropriate, uh, and then we'll crack on with this stuff. Uh, I think, as I said last week, um, we will get to the end of Life, the Universe, and Everything this evening. Uh, and then I'm going to take a break for a few weeks uh, just to sort of chill out a bit. Hello, Niels, another faithful listener. Good to see you there, sir. Uh, But yeah, so I'll be taking a short break, um, maybe, I don't know, two, three, four weeks tops, um, just to sort of recharge, uh, and then we'll crack on with the rest of the trilogy. We've got still got two books to go after this one uh, to to wrap things up. Uh, So as soon as we get to the point that that's all done, um, what I will be doing in the meantime is asking you for input, oh, wonderful listeners and viewers, for perhaps the next series of books that we can look at doing. Um, uh, Once we've sort of finished off um, the Douglas Adams material, there is a a rich vein of other material that we can dive into that I can read for you. So uh, just let me know your thoughts on that. Um, I'm getting lots of lovely messages from people all over the place, so it's really sweet of you. Thank you very much if you've written to me. If I haven't replied, I'm sorry, I have been quite busy. Um, but I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If I have replied to you, I'm sorry if I sound mad. Um, but, you know, hey, that's the way things are. Um, right, uh, I think that's enough blether to start with. Shall we crack on? Um, thank you very much, everybody, for being here, as usual. Uh, let's crack on uh, with the final part of Life, the Universe, and Everything. Okay. Just to recap quickly, um, we have got to the point where um, uh, Arthur Dent inadvertently learned how to fly uh, and got hit in the back of the small of the back um, by... Oh, hello, my mother's just just here saying, Hi there, just joined you after our chicken and asparagus, which was lovely. So so, uh, just letting you know, everyone everyone in the world, my mum has made some fantastic chicken and asparagus and they were very pleased with it. Um, Right, sorry (laughs) sorry about that. Um... Yeah, uh, where where was... Oh, yes, yes, exactly. Uh, Arthur Dent had been hit in the back of the... Small of the back by a floating party, which has since itself been interrupted, gate-crashed by the cricket robots, uh, and they have um, taken away the the award for... What was it? It was the award for the most uh, creative use of the word fuck in a documentary, I think. Um, And that has has meant that's actually the last part of the the, uh, uh, wicket gate. 
Uh, and so the, the crew of the Bistro Mathur are feeling a bit low, trying to figure out what to do next. But one of the things that was taken away from the party before it crashed to Earth, uh, or crashed to whatever planet it was, uh, was a um, uh, some crisps, a packet of potato chips, potato crisps, uh, Ford had taken with him, and that has disappeared. He's, he was really quite peeved with that. But we found out at the end that quite possibly they are being munched by Trillian, um, who has since rejoined the crew after being spirited away from the clutches of Thor, who was very, very strong and very, very stupid. Um, and she is in the room of informational illusions munching on the crisps, and that's where we pick the story up. So, have fun this evening. It is a mistake to think that you can solve any major problems just with potatoes. For instance, there was once an insanely aggressive race of people called the Silastic Armour Fiends of Stritorax, and that was just the name of their race. The name of their army was something quite horrific. Luckily, they lived even further back in galactic history than anything we've so far encountered, 20 billion years ago, when the galaxy was young and fresh and every idea worth fighting for was a new one. And fighting was what the Silastic Armour Fiends of Stritorax were good at. And being good at it, they did it a lot. They fought their enemies, i.e. everybody else, and they fought each other. Their planet was a complete wreck. The surface was littered with abandoned cities, which were surrounded by abandoned war machines, which were, in turn, surrounded by deep bunkers in which the Silastic armor fiends lived and squabbled with each, with each other. The best way to pick a fight with a Silastic armor fiend of Stritorax was just to be born. They didn't like it. They got resentful. And when an armor fiend got resentful, someone got hurt. An exhausting way of life, one might think, but they did seem to have an awful lot of energy. The best way of dealing with a Silastic armor fiend was to put him in a room on his own, because sooner or later he would simply beat himself up. Eventually, they realized that this was something they were going to have to sort out, and they passed a law decreeing that anyone who had to carry a weapon as part of his normal Silastic work, policemen, security guards, primary school teachers, etc., had to spend at least 45 minutes every day punching a sack of potatoes in order to work off his or her surplus aggression. For a while, this worked well, until someone thought that it would be a much more efficient and less time-consuming thing if they just shot the potatoes instead. This led to renewed enthusiasm for shooting all sorts of things, and they all got very excited at the prospect of their first major war for weeks. Another achievement of the Silastic Armour Fiends of Stritorax is that they were the first race who ever managed to shock a computer. The Silistic, Silastic Armour Fiends of Stritorax were engaged in one of their regular wars with the strenuous gar fighters of Stug, and were not enjoying it as much as usual because it involved an awful lot of trekking through the radiation swamps of Kulzenda and across the fire mountains of Frasfraga, neither of which terrains they felt much at home in. So, when the strangulous stilettons of Jaji Zigzag joined in the foray in the forest... Sorry, we'll try that again, shall we, children? So when the Strangulus Stilettons of Jaja Zikstak joined in the fray and forced them to fight on another front in the Gamma Caves of Carfrax and the Ice Storms of Val and Guten, they decided that enough was enough, and they ordered Haktar to design them an ultimate weapon. What do you mean? asked Haktar. By ultimate to which the Silastic Armour Fiends of Stritorax said, Read a bloody dictionary! and plunged back into the fray. So, Haktar designed an ultimate weapon. It was a very, very small bomb, which was simply a junction box in hyperspace that would, when activated, connect the heart 
of every major sun with the heart of every other major sun simultaneously, and thus turn the entire universe into one gigantic hyperspatial supernova. When the Silastic armor fiends tried to use it to blow up a strangular stiletton munitions dump in one of the Gamma Caves, they were extremely irritated that it didn't work, and said so. Hektar had been shocked by the whole idea. He tried to explain that he had been thinking about this ultimate weapon business and had worked out that there was no conceivable consequence of not setting the bomb off that was worse than the known consequence of setting it off, and therefore he had taken the liberty of introducing a small flaw into the design of the bomb, and he hoped that everyone involved would, on sober reflection, feel that the Silastic Armour Fiends disagreed and pulverised the computer. Later, they thought better of it and destroyed the faulty bomb as well. Then, pausing only to smash the hell out of the strenuous Garfighters of Stug and the strangular stilettons of Jaja Zigzag, they went on to find an entirely new way of blowing themselves up, which was a profound relief to everyone else in the galaxy, particularly the Garfighters, the Stilettons, and the Potatoes. Trillian had watched all this, as well as the story of Cricket. She emerged from the Room of Information Illusions thoughtfully, just in time to discover that they had arrived too late. Even as the starship Bistromath flickered into objective, being on top... Sorry, I need a slurp of water. Hmm. Ah, right. Even as the starship Bistromath flickered into objective being on the top of a small cliff on the mile-wide asteroid which pursued a lonely and eternal path in orbit around the enclosed star system of Cricket, its crew was aware that they were only in time to be witness to an unstoppable historic event. They didn't realise they were going to see two. They stood cold, lonely and helpless on the cliff edge and watched the activity below. Lances of light wheeled in sinister arcs against the void from a point only about a hundred yards below and in front of them. They stared into the blinding event. An extension of the ship's field enabled them to stand there by once again exploiting the mind's predisposition to have tricks played on it. The problems of falling up off the tiny mass of the asteroid or of not being able to breathe simply became somebody else's. The white cricket warship was parked amongst the stark grey crags of the asteroid, alternately flaring under arc lights or disappearing in shadow. The blackness of the shaped shadows cast by the hard rocks danced together in wild choreography as the arc lights swept round them. The eleven white robots were bearing, in procession, the wicket key out into the middle of a circle of swinging lights. The wicket key was rebuilt. Its components shone and glittered, the steel pillar, or Marvin's leg, of strength and power, the gold bale, or heart of the infin infinite improbability drive, of prosperity, the perspex pillar, or Argibuthon scepter of justice, of science and reason, the silver bale, or Rory award for the most gratuitous use of the word fuck in a serious screenplay, and the now reconstituted wooden pillar, or ashes of a burnt stump, signifying the death of English cricket, of nature and spirituality. I suppose there is nothing we can do at this point, asked Arthur, Arthur rather nervously. No, sighed Slarty Bartfast. The expression of disappointment which crossed Arthur's face 
was a complete failure, and since he was standing obscured by shadow, he allowed it to collapse into one of relief. Pity, he said. We have no weapons, said Slarty Bartfast, stupidly. Damn, said Arthur, very quietly. Ford said nothing. Trillian said nothing, but in a peculi peculiarly thoughtful and distinct way. She was staring at that blackness of the space beyond the asteroid. The asteroid circled the dust cloud which surrounded the slow time envelope which enclosed the world on which lived the people of Cricket, the masters of Cricket, and their killer robots. The helpless group had no way of knowing whether or not the cricket robots were aware of their presence. They could only assume they must be, but that they felt, quite rightly in the circumstances, that they had nothing to fear. They had an historic task to perform, and their audience could be regarded with contempt. Terrible, impotent feeling, isn't it? said Arthur, but the others ignored him. In the centre of the area of light which the robots were approaching, a square-shaped crack appeared in the ground. The crack defined itself more and more distinctly, and soon it became clear that a block of the ground, about six feet square, was slowly rising. At the same time, they became aware of some other movement, but it was almost subliminal, and for a moment or two it was not clear what it was that was moving. Then it became clear. The asteroid was moving. It was moving slowly in towards the dust cloud, as if being hauled in inexorably by some celestri celestial angler in its depths. They were to make in real life the journey through the cloud which they had already made in the room of informational illusions. They stood frozen in silence. And Trillian frowned. An age seemed to pass. Events seemed to pass with spinning slowness as the leading edge of the asteroid passed into the vague and soft outer perimeter of the cloud. And soon they were engulfed in a thin, dancing obscurity. They passed on through it, on and on, dimly aware of vague shapes and walls indistinguishable in the darkness except in the corner of the eye. The dust dimmed the shafts of brilliant light. The shafts of brilliant light twinkled on the myriad specks of dust. Trillian again regarded the passage from within her own frowning thoughts. And they were through it. Whether it had taken a minute or half an hour, they weren't entirely sure, but they were through it and confronted with a fresh blankness, as if space were pinched out of existence in front of them. And now things moved quickly. A blinding shaft of light seemed to almost explode from out of the block which had risen three feet out of the ground, and out of that rose a smaller perspex block, dazzling with interior dancing colours. The block was slotted with deep grooves, three upright and two across, clearly designed to accept the wicket key. The robots approached the lock, slotted the key into its home, and stepped back again. The block twisted round of its own accord, and space began to alter. As space unpinched itself, it seemed agonisingly to twist the eyes of the watchers in their sockets. They found themselves staring, blinded, at an unravelled sun which stood now before them where it seemed only seconds before there had not been even empty space. It was a second or two before they were even sufficiently aware of what had happened to throw their hands up over their horrified, blinded eyes. In that second or two, they were aware of a tiny speck moving slowly, across the eye of that sun. 
they staggered back and heard ringing in their ears the thin and unexpected chant of the robots crying out in unison. Cricket, 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 cricket. The sound chilled them. It was harsh, it was cold, it was empty, and it was mechanically dismal. It was also triumphant. They were so stunned by these two sensory shocks that they almost missed the second historic event. Zaphod Beeblebrox, the only man in history to survive a direct blast attack from the cricket robots, ran out of the cricket warship brandishing a zap gun. OK, he cried, this situation is totally under control as of this moment in time. The single robot guarding the hatchway to the ship sli silently swung his battle club and connected it with the back of Zaphod's left head. Who the Zark did that? said the left head and lolled sickeningly forward. His right head gazed keenly into the middle distance. Who did what? it said. The club connected with the back of his right head. Zaphod measured his length as a rather strange shape on the ground. Within a matter of seconds, the whole event was over. A few blasts from the robots were sufficient to destroy the lock forever. It split and melted and splayed its contents brokenly. The robots marched grimly, and it almost seemed in a slightly disheartened manner, back into their warship, which, with a foop, was gone. Trillian and Ford ran hectically round and down the steep incline into the dark, still body of Zaphod Beeblebrox. I don't know, said Zaphod, for what seemed to him like the 37th time. They, they could have killed me, but, but they didn't. Maybe they just thought I was a kind of wonderful guy or something. I could understand that. The others silently registered their opinions of this theory. Zaphod lay on the cold floor of the flight deck. His back seemed to wrestle with the floor as pain th thudded through him and banged at his heads. I think, he whispered, that there is something wrong with those anodized dudes. Something fundamentally weird. They are programmed to kill everybody, Slarty Bartfast pointed out. That, wheezed Zaphod between the whacking thuds, could be it. He didn't seem altogether convinced. Hey, baby, he said to Trillian, hoping this would make up for all of his previous behaviour. You all right? she said gently. Yeah, he said. I, I'm fine. Good, she said, and walked away to think. She stared at the huge visi screen over the eight couches, and, twisting a switch, she flipped local images over it. One image was the blankness of the dust cloud, one was the son of Cricket, one was of Cricket itself, and she flipped between them fiercely. Well, that's uh, goodbye galaxy, then, said Arthur, slapping his knees and standing up. No, said Slotty Bartfast gravely, our course is clear. He furrowed his brow until you could grow some of the smaller root vegetables in it. He stood up, he paced around, and when he spoke again, what he said frightened him so much that he had to sit down again. We must go down to cricket, he said. A deep sigh shook his old frame, and his eyes seemed almost to rattle in their sockets. Once again, he said, we have failed pathetically, quite pathetically. That, said Ford quietly, is because we don't care enough. I told you. 
He swung his feet up onto the instrument panel and picked fitfully at something on one of his fingernails. But unless we determine to take action, said the old man querulously, as if struggling against something deeply insouciant in his nature, then we shall be all destroyed. We shall all die. Surely, surely we care about that. Not enough to want to get killed over it said Ford. He put on a sort of hollow smile and flipped it round the room at anyone who wanted to see it. Slarty Bartfast clearly found this point of view extremely seductive and he fought against it. He turned again to Zaphod, who was gritting his teeth and sweating with the pain. You surely must have some idea, he said, of why they spared your life. It seems most strange and unusual. I, uh, I kind of think that even they didn't know, shrugged Zaphod. I told you, they hit me with the most feeble blast, just knocked me out, right? They lugged me into their ship, dumped me in a corner, and ignored me. Like, they were embarrassed about me being there. If I said anything, they knocked me out again. We had some great conversations. Hey, Urg! Hi there, Urg! I wonder, Urg! Kept me amused for hours, you know. He winced again. He was toying with something in his fingers. He held it up. It was the gold bale, the heart of gold, the heart of the infinite improbability drive. Only that and the wooden pillar had survived the destruction of the lock intact. Hey, uh, I hear your ship can, uh, like, move a bit, he said. So uh, how would you like to zip me back to mine before you... Will you not help us? said Slarty Bartfast. Us? said Ford sharply. Who's us? Ah, I'd love to stay and help you save the galaxy, insisted Zaphod, raising him up onto his shoulders. But I have the mother and father of a pair of headaches, and I feel a lot of little headaches coming on. But hey, next time it needs saving, I'm your guy. Hey, Trillion, baby. She looked around briefly. Yes? You want to come? Heart of gold? Excitement? Adventure? Really wild things? I'm going down to cricket, she said. It was the same hill, and yet not the same. This time it was not an informational illusion. This was cricket itself, and they were standing on it. Near them, behind the trees, stood the strange Italian restaurant which had brought these, their real bodies, to this, the real present world of cricket. The strong grass under their feet was real, the rich soil, real too. The heady fragrances from the tree, too, were real. The night was real night. Cricket. Possibly the most dangerous place in the galaxy for anyone who isn't a cricketer to stand. The place that could not countenance the existence of any other place whose charming, delightful, intelligent inhabitants would howl with fear, savagery and murderous hate when confronted with anyone not their own. Arthur shuddered. Slarty Bartfast shuddered. Ford, surprisingly, shuddered. It was not surprising that he shuddered. It was surprising that he was there at all. But when they'd returned Zaphod to his ship, Ford had felt unexpectedly shamed into not running away. Wrong, he thought to himself. Wrong, 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 wrong. He hugged to himself one of the zap guns with which they had armed themselves out of Zaphod's armoury. Trillian shuddered and frowned as she looked into the sky. This, too, was not the same. It was no longer blank and empty. 
Whilst the countryside around them had changed little in the 2,000 years of the cricket wars and the mere five years that had elapsed locally since cricket was sealed into its slow time envelope 10 billion years ago, the sky, however, was dramatically different. Dim lights and heavy shapes hung in it. High in the sky, where no cricketer ever looked, were the war zones, the robot zones. Huge warships and tower blocks floating in the Nilograv fields far above the idyllic pastoral lands of the surface of cricket. Trillian stared at them and thought. Trillian, whispered Ford Prefect to her. Yes, she said. What are you doing? Thinking. Do you always breathe like that when you're thinking? I wasn't aware that I was breathing. That's what worried me. I think I know, said Trillian. Shh! said Slarty Bartfast in alarm, and his thin, trembling hand motioned them further back beneath the shadow of the tree. Suddenly, as before in the tape, there were lights coming along the hill path, but this time the dancing beams were not from lanterns, but electric torches, not itself in a dramatic change, but every little detail made their hearts thump with fear. This time there were no lilting, whimsical songs about flowers and farming and dead dogs, but hushed voices in urgent debate. A light moved in the sky with a slow weight. Arthur was clenched with a claustrophobic terror, and the wind was warm but caught at his throat. Within seconds, a second party became visible, approaching from the other side of the dark hill. They were moving swiftly and purposefully, their torches swinging and probing around them. The parties were clearly converging, but not merely with each other. They were converging deliberately on the spot where Arthur and the others were standing. Arthur heard the slight rustle as Ford Prefect raised his zap gun to his shoulder and the slight whimpering cough as Slarty Bartfast raised his. He felt the cold, unfamiliar weight of his own gun and with shaking hands he raised it. His fingers fumbled to release the safety catch and engage the extreme danger catch as Ford had shown him. He was shaking so much that if he'd fired at anybody at that moment, he probably would have burnt his signature onto them. Only Trillian didn't raise her gun. She raised her eyebrows, lowered them again, and bit her lip in thought. Has it occurred to you, she began, but nobody wanted to discuss anything much at the moment. A light stabbed through the darkness from behind them, and they spun around to find a third party of cricketers behind them, searching them out with their torches. Ford Prefect's guns sorry, Ford Prefect's gun cracked viciously, but fire spat back at it and it crashed from his hands. There was a moment of pure fear, a frozen second before anyone fired again. And at the end of the second, nobody fired. They were surrounded by pale-faced cricketers and bathed in bobbing torchlight. The captors stared at their sorry, the captives stared at their captors, and the captors stared at their captives. Um, hello, said one of the captors. Excuse me, but are you? Aliens. Meanwhile, more millions of miles away than the mind can comfortably encompass, Zaphod Beeblebrox was throwing a mood again. He had repaired his ship, that is, he'd watched it with alert interest, whilst a service robot had repaired it for him. 
It was now, once again, one of the most powerful and extraordinary ships in existence. He could go anywhere. He could do anything. He fiddled with a book and then tossed it away. It was the one he'd read before. He walked over to the communications systems and opened an all-frequency channel. <sighs> Anyone want a drink? he said. This is an emergency, Fowler, crackled a voice from halfway across the galaxy. <sighs> Got any mixers, said Zaphod. Go take a ride on a comet. OK, OK, said Zaphod, and flipped the channel shut again. He sighed and sat down. He got up again and wandered over to a computer screen. He idly pushed a few buttons. Little blobs started to rush around the screen, eating each other. Pow, said Zaphod. Free coo, pop, pop, pop. Hi there, said the computer brightly after a minute of this. You have scored three points. Previous best score, seven million five hundred and ninety-seven thousand two hundred... OK, OK, said Zaphod, and flipped the screen back off again. He sat down again. He played with a pencil, and this, too, slowly started to lose its fascination. OK, OK, he said, and fed his score and the previous best one into the computer. His ship made a blur of the universe. Tell us, said the thin, pale-faced cricketer, who'd stepped forward from the ranks of the others and stood uncertainly in the circle of torchlight, handling his gun as if he was just sort of holding it for someone else who'd just popped off somewhere. But we'll be back in a minute. Um, do, do you know anything about something called the balance of nature? There was no reply from their captives, or at least nothing more articulate than a few confused mumbles and grunts. The torchlight continued to play over them. High in the sky above them, dark activity continued in the robot zones. It's just, continued the cricketer uneasily, something we heard about. Probably, probably nothing important. Well, I suppose we better kill you then. He looked down at his gun as if he was trying to find which bit to press. That is, he said, looking up again, unless there's anything you want to talk about. Slow, numb astonishment crept up the bodies of Slarty Bartfast, Ford and Arthur. Very soon it would reach their brains, which were, at the moment, solely occupied with the moving of their jawbones up and down. Trillian was shaking her head as if trying to finish a jigsaw by shaking the box. We're worried, you see, said another man from the crowd, about this plan of universal destruction. Yes, said another, and the balance of nature. It just seemed to us that if the whole of the rest of the universe is destroyed, it will somehow upset the balance of nature. And we're quite keen on ecology, you see. His voice trailed away unhappily. And sport, said another more loudly, and this got a cheer of approval from the others. Oh, yes, agreed the first, and sport. He looked back at his fellows uneasily and scratched fitfully at his cheek. He seemed to be wrestling with some deep inner confusion, as if everything he, everything he wanted to say and everything he thought were entirely different things, between which he could see no possible connection. I've had thoughts like that, believe me. You see, he mumbled, some of us... And he looked around again as if for confirmation. The others made encouraging noises. Some of us, he continued, are, are quite keen to have sporting links with the rest of the galaxy... Uh, and though I can see the argument about keeping sport out of politics, I think that if, if we want to have sporting links with the rest of the galaxy, which we do, then it's probably a bit of a mistake to destroy it. And indeed, the rest of the universe, his voice trailed away again, which is 
What seems to be the idea now? Who? Huh? said Slotty Bartfast. Who? Huh? Huh? said Arthur. Uh, uh, said Ford Prefect. Okay, said Trillian. Let's talk about it. She w walked forward and took the poor confused cricketer by the arm. He looked about twenty-five, which meant because of the peculiar manglings of time that had been going on in this area, he would have been just about twenty when the cricket wars were finished ten billion years ago. Trillian led him for a short walk through the torchlight before she said anything more. He stumbled uncertainly after her. The encircling torch beams were drooping now slightly, as if they were abdicating to this strange, quiet girl, who alone in this universe of dark confusion seemed to know what she was doing. She turned and faced him, and lightly held both his arms. He was a picture of bewildered misery. Tell me, she said. He said nothing for a moment, whilst his gaze darted from one of her eyes to the other. We, he said, we have to be alone, I think. He screwed up his face and then dropped his head forward, shaking it like someone trying to shake a coin out of a money box. He looked up again. We, we have this bomb now. You see, he said, and it's just a little one. I know, she said. He goggled at her as if she'd said something very strange about beetroots. Honestly, he said, it's very, very little. I know, she said again. But they... But they say, his voice trailed on, they say it can destroy everything that exists. And, and we have to do that, you see, I think. Will that make us alone? I, I don't know. It seems to be our function, though, he said, and dropped his head again. Whatever that means, said a hollow voice from the crowd. Trillian slowly put her arms around the poor, bewildered young crit cricketer and patted his trembling head on her shoulder. It's all right, she said quietly, but clearly enough for the shadowy crowd to hear. You don't have to do it. She rocked him. You don't have to do it, she said again. She let him go and stood back. I, I, I want you to do something for me, she said, and unexpectedly laughed. I want, she said, and laughed again. She put her hand over her mouth, and then she said it with a straight face. I want you to take me to your leader. And she pointed into the war zones in the sky. She seemed somehow to know that their leader would be there. She laughed, and her laughter seemed to discharge something in the atmosphere. From somewhere at the back of the crowd, a single voice started to sing a tune which would have enabled McCartney, had he written it, to buy the entire world. Zaphod Beeblebrox crawled bravely along a tunnel, like the hell of a guy that he was. He was very confused, but continued crawling doggedly anyway, because he was that brave. He was confused by something that he'd just seen, but not half as confused as he was going to be by something that he was about to hear, so it would now be best to explain exactly where he was. He was in the robot war zones, many, many miles above the surface of the planet Cricket. The atmosphere was thin here and relatively unprotected from any rays or anything which space might care to hurl in his direction. 
He had parked the starship Heart of Gold amongst the huge, jostling, dim hulks that crowded the sky here above Cricket, and had entered what appeared to be the biggest and most important of the sky buildings, armed with nothing but a zap gun and something for both of his headaches. He'd found himself in a long, wide and badly lit corridor in which he was able to hide until he worked out what it was he was going to do next. He hid because every now and then one of the cricket robots would walk along it, and although he had so far led some kind of charmed life at their hands, it had nevertheless been an extremely painful one, and he had no desire to stretch what he was only half inclined to call his good fortune. He had ducked at one point into a room leading off the corridor, and had discovered it to be a huge and again dimly lit chamber. It was, in fact, a museum with just one exhibit. The wreckage of a spacecraft. It was terribly burnt and mangled, and now that he had caught up with some of the galactic history he'd missed through his failed attempts to have sex in the girl in, with the girl in the cyber cubicle next to him at school, he was able to put in an intelligent guess that this was the wrecked spaceship which had drifted through the dust cloud all those billions of years ago and started the whole bang shoot off. But, and this is where he had become confused, there was something not at all right about it. It was genuinely wrecked, it was genuinely burnt, but a fairly brief inspection by an experienced eye revealed that it was not a genuine spacecraft. It was as if it was a full-scale model of one, a solid blueprint in other words, it was a very useful thing to have around if you suddenly decided to build a spaceship yourself and didn't have the first idea of how to do it. It was not, however, anything that would ever fly anywhere itself. He was still puzzling over this. In fact, he'd only just started to puzzle over it when he became aware that a door had slid open in another part of the chamber and a couple of cricket robots had entered, looking a little glum. Zaphod did not want to tangle with them and, deciding that just as discretion was the better part of valour, so cowardice was the better part of discretion and he valiantly hid himself in a cupboard. The cupboard, in fact, turned out to be the top part of a shaft, which led down through an inspection hatch into a wide ventilation tunnel. He let himself down into it and started to crawl along it, which is where we found him. He didn't like it. It was cold, it was dark, it was profoundly uncomfortable, and it frightened him. At the first opportunity, which was another shaft a hundred yards further along, he climbed Buck back up out of it. This time, he emerged into a smaller chamber, which appeared to be a computer intelligence centre. He emerged in a dark, narrow space, between a large computer bank and the wall. He quickly learned that he was not alone in the chamber, and started to leave again, but when he began to listen with interest, he stopped, because it was interesting to hear what the other occupants had to say. "'It's the robots, sir,' said one voice. "'There's something wrong with them.' "'What exactly?' "'These were the voices of two War Command cricketers. "'All the War Commanders lived up in the sky in the robot war zones "'and were largely immune to the whimsical doubts and uncertainties "'which were afflicting their fellows down on the surface of the planet.' Well, sir, I think it's just as well that they're being phased out of the war effort and that we are now going to detonate the supernova bomb in the very short time since we were released from the envelope. Get to the point. The robots aren't enjoying it, sir. What? The war, sir. It seems to be getting them down. There's a, a certain world weariness about them. Or perhaps I should say... Universe weariness. Well, that's all right. They are meant to be helping to destroy it. Well, yes. Uh, well, they're finding it difficult, sir. They're, they're afflicted with a certain lassitude. They're just finding it hard to get behind the job. They lack oomph. 
What are you trying to say? Well, I think... I think they're very depressed about something, sir. What on cricket are you talking about? Well, in the few skirmishes we've had recently, it seems that they go into battle, raise their weapons to get to fire, and suddenly think, why bother? What, cosmically speaking, is it all about? And they just seem to get a little tired and a little grim. And then what do they do? Ah, uh, quadratic equations, mostly, sir. Fiendishly difficult ones, by all accounts. And then they sulk. Sulk? Yes, sir. Who ever heard of a robot sulking? I don't know, sir. What was that noise? It was the noise of Zaphod leaving with his head spinning. In a deep well of darkness, a crippled robot sat. It had been silent in its metallic darkness for some time. It was cold and damp. But being a robot, it was supposed to not be able to notice these things. With an enormous effort of will, however, it did manage to notice them. Its brain had been harnessed to the central intelligence core of the cricket war computer. It wasn't enjoying the experience, and neither was the central intelligence core of the cricket war computer. The cricket robots who'd salvaged this pathetic metal creature from the swamps of Squanchellus Zeta had done so because they had recognised almost immediately its gigantic intelligence and the use which this could be to them. They hadn't reckoned with the attendant personality disorders, which the coldness, the darkness, the dampness, the crampedness and the loneliness were doing nothing to decrease. It was not happy with its task. Apart from anything else, the mere coordination of an entire planet's military strategy was taking up only a tiny part of its formidable mind, and the rest of it had become extremely bored. Having solved all the major mathematical, physical, chemical, biological, sociological, philosophical, etymological, meteorological and psychological problems of the universe, except his own, three times over, he was severely stuck for something to do, and had taken up composing short, dolorous ditties of no tune, or indeed tune, sorry, of no tone, or indeed tune. The latest was a lullaby. Now the world has gone to bed, Marvin droned. Darkness won't engulf my head. I can see by infrared how I hate the night. He paused to gather the artistic and emotional strength to tackle the next verse. Now I lay me down to sleep try to count electric sheep sweet dream wishes you can keep how i hate the night marvin hissed a voice his head snapped up, almost dislodging the intricate network of electrodes which connected him to the central cricket war computer. An inspection hatch had opened, and one of a pair of unruly heads was peering through whilst the other kept on jogging it by continually darting to look this way and that extremely nervously. Oh, it's you, muttered the robot. I might have known. Hey, kid, said Zaphod in astonishment. 
Was that you singing just then? I am, Marvin acknowledged bitterly, in particularly scintillating form at the moment. Zaphod poked his head in through the hatchway and looked around. Are you alone? he said. Yes, said Marvin. Wearily I sit here, pain and misery my only companions, and vast intelligence, of course, and infinite sorrow. And, yeah, said Zaphod, hey, uh, what's your connection with all of this? This, said Marvin, indicating with his less damaged arm all the electrodes which, electrodes which connected him with the cricket computer. Then, said Zaphod awkwardly, I guess you must have just saved my life, like, twice. Three times, said Marvin. Zaphod's head snapped round. His other one was looking hawkishly in entirely the wrong direction, just in time to see the lethal killer robot directly behind him seize up and start to smoke. It staggered backwards and slumped against a wall. It slid down it. It slipped sideways, threw its head back, and started to sob inconsolably. Zaphod looked back at Marvin. "'You must have a terrific outlook on life,' he said. "'Just don't even ask,' said Marvin. "'I won't,' said Zaphod, and didn't. "'Hey, look,' he added, "'you're doing a terrific job.' "'Which means, I suppose,' said Marvin, requiring only one ten thousand million billion trillion grillionth part of his mental powers to make this particular logical leap, "'that you're not going to release me or anything like that. "'Kid, you know I'd love to, but you're not going to. "'No.' "'I see.' You're working well. Yes, said Marvin. Why stop now, just when I'm hating it? I gotta go find Trillian and the guys. Hey, have you any idea where they are? I mean, I just got a planet to choose from. Could take a while. They are very close, said Marvin dolefully. You can monitor them from here if you'd like. I uh, better go get them asserted Zaphod. Er, uh, maybe they need some help, right? Maybe, said Marvin, and then with unexpected authority in his lugubrious voice, it would be better if you monitored them from here. That young girl, he added unexpectedly, is one of the least benightedly unintelligent organic life forms. It has been my profound lack of pleasure not to be able to avoid meeting. Zaphod took a moment or two to find his way through this labyrinthine string of negatives and emerged at the other end with surprise. Tr Trillian, he said with surprise. She's, she's just a kid. Cute, yeah, but temperamental. You know how it is with women? Or perhaps you don't. Uh, I assume you don't. If you do, I don't want to hear about it. Plug us in. Totally manipulated. What? said Zaphod. It was Trillian speaking. He turned around. The wall against which the cricket robot was sobbing had lit up to reveal a scene taking place in some other unknown part of the cricket uh, robot war zones. It seemed to be a council chamber of some kind. Zaphod couldn't make it out too clearly because of the robot slumped against the screen. He tried to move the robot, but it was heavy with its grief and tried to bite him, so he just looked around it as best he could. Just think about it, said Trillian's voice. Your history is just a series of freakishly improbable events, and I know an improbable event when I see one. Your complete isolation from the galaxy was freakish for a start, right out on the very edge with a dust cloud around you. It's a setup, obviously. Zaphod was mad with frustration that he couldn't see the screen. 
The robot's head was obscuring his view of the people Trillian was talking to. Its multifunctional battle club was obscuring the background, and the elbow of the arm it had pressed tragically against its brow was obscuring Trillian herself. Then, said Trillian, this spaceship that crash-landed on your planet, that's really likely, isn't it? Have you any idea of what the odds are against a drifting spaceship accidentally intersecting with the orbit of a planet? Hey, said Zaphod, she doesn't know what the Zog she's talking about. I've seen that spaceship. It's fake. No deal. I thought it might be said Marvin from his prison behind Zaphod. Oh, yeah, said Zaphod. That's easy for you to say. I just told you. Anyway, I don't see what it's got to do with anything. And especially, continued Trillian, the odds against it intersecting with the orbit of the one planet in the galaxy, or of the whole universe, as far as I know, that would probably be totally traumatised to see it. You don't know what the odds are? No, nor do I. They're that big. Again, it's a setup. I wouldn't be surprised if that spaceship was just a fake. Zaphod managed to move the robot's battle club. Behind it on the screen were the figures of Ford, Arthur and Slarty Bartfast, who appeared astonished and bewildered by the whole thing. Hey, look, said Z Zaphod excitedly. The guys are doing great. Ra ra ra! Go get them, guys! And what about, said Trillian, all this technology you suddenly managed to build for yourselves almost overnight? Most people would take thousands of years to do all that. Someone was feeding you with what you needed to know, and someone was keeping you at it. I know, I know, she added in response to some unseen interruption. I know you didn't realise it was going on. That is exactly my point. You never realised anything at all, like this supernova bomb. How do you know about that? said an unseen voice. I just know, said Trillian. You expect me to believe that you are bright enough to invent something that is brilliant and be too dumb to realise that it would take you with it as well? That's not just stupid, that's spectacularly obtuse. Hey, what's this bomb thing? said Zaphod in alarm to Marvin. The supernova bomb, said Marvin. It's a very... Very small bomb. Yeah? That would destroy the universe in toto, added Marvin. Good idea, if you ask me. They won't get it to work, though. Why not, if it's so brilliant? It's brilliant, said Marvin. They're not. They got as far as designing it before they were locked in the envelope. They spent the last five years building it. They think they've got it right, but they haven't. They're as stupid as any other organic life form. I hate them. Trillian was continuing. Zaphod tried to pull the cricket robot away by its leg, but it kicked and growled at him, and then quaked with a fresh outburst of sobbing. Then suddenly it slumped over and continued to express its feelings out of the way of everybody on the floor. Trillian was standing alone in the middle of the chamber. Tired... Sorry. Trillian was standing alone in the middle of the chamber, tired out but with fiercely burning eyes. Ranged in front of her were the pale-faced and wrinkled elder masters of cricket, motionless behind their widely curved control desk, staring at her with helpless fear and hatred. In front of them, equidistant between their control desk and the middle of the chamber, were, where, where Trillian stood, as if on trial, was a slim white pillar, about four feet tall. On top of it stood a white globe, about three, maybe four inches in diameter. Beside it stood a cricket robot with its multifunctional battle club. In fact, 
he explained Trillian. You are so dumb, so stupid. She was sweating. Zephod felt that this was an unattractive thing for her to be doing at this point. You are all so dumb, stupid, that I doubt that... Well, I doubt very much that you've been able to build the bomb properly without any help from Haktar for the last five years. Who's this guy, Haktar? said Zaphod, squaring his shoulders. If Marvin replied, Zaphod didn't hear him. All his attention was concentrated on the screen. One of the elders of cricket made a small motion with his hand towards the cricket robot, and the robot raised its club. There's nothing I can do, said Marvin. It's on an independent circuit from the others. Wait, said Trillian. The elder made a small motion. The robot halted. Trillian suddenly seemed very doubtful of her own judgment. How do you know all this? said Zaphod to Marvin at this point. Computer records said Marvin. I have access. You're, you're very different, aren't you, said Trillian to the Elder Masters, from your fellow worldlings down on the ground. You spent all your lives up here, unprotected by the atmosphere. You've been very vulnerable. The rest of your race is very frightened, you know. They don't want you to do this. You're out of touch. Why don't you check up? The cricket elder grew impatient. He made a gesture to the robot which was precisely the opposite of the gesture he had just made to it. The robot swung its battle club. It hit the small white globe. The small white globe was the supernova bomb. It was a very, very small bomb which was designed to bring the entire universe to an end. The supernova bomb flew through the air. It hit the back wall of the council chamber and dented it very badly. So how does she know all this? said Zaphod. Marvin kept a sullen silence. Probably just bluffing, said Zaphod. Poor kid. I should never have left her alone. Hector, called Trillian. What are you up to? There was no reply from the enclosing darkness. Trillian waited nervously. She was sure that she couldn't be wrong. She peered into the gloom from which she had been expecting some kind of response, but there was only cold silence. Hector, she called again, I would like you to meet my friend, Arthur Dent. I wanted to go off with the Thunder God, but he wouldn't let me, and I appreciate that. He made me realise where my affections really lay. Unfortunately, Zaphod is too frightened by all of this, so I bought Arthur instead. I'm not sure why I'm telling you all this. Hello, she said again, Hector. And then it came... It was thin and feeble, like a voice carried on the wind from a great distance, half heard, a memory, or a dream of a voice. "'Won't you both come out?' said this voice. "'I promise that you will be perfectly safe.' They glanced at each other, and then stepped out, improbably, along the shaft of light which streamed out of the open hatchway of the Heart of Gold into the dim, granular darkness of the dust cloud. Arthur tried to hold her hand to steady and reassure her, but she wouldn't let him. He held on to his airline holdall with its tin of Greek olive oil, its towel, its crumpled postcards of Santorini, and its other odds and ends. He steadied and reassured that instead. They were standing on and in nothing. Murky, dusty, nothing. Each grain of dust in the pulverised computer sparked dimly as it turned out and dimmed and twisted, it turned and twisted slowly, catching the sunlight in the darkness. 
each particle of the computer, each speck of dust, held within itself, faintly and weakly, the pattern of the whole. In reducing the computer to dust, the silastic armour fiends of Stritorax had merely crippled the computer, not killed it. A weak and insubstantial field held the particles in slight relationships with each other. Arthur and Trillian stood, or rather floated, in the middle of this bizarre entity. They had nothing to breathe, but for the moment this seemed not to matter. Hactar kept his promise. They were safe for the moment. I have nothing to offer you by way of hospitality, said Hactar faintly, but tricks of the light. Is it possible to be comfortable with tricks of the light, though, if that is all you have? His voice evanesced, and in the dark dust a long velvet paisley-covered sofa coalesced into a hazy shape. Arthur could hardly bear the fact that it was this same sofa which had appeared to him in the fields of prehistoric earth. He wanted to shout and shake with rage that the universe kept doing these insanely bewildering things to him. He let this feeling subside and then sat on the sofa carefully. Trillian sat on it too. It was real. At least, if it wasn't real, it did support them, and that is what sofas are support, supposed to do. This, by any test that mattered, was a real sofa. The voice on the solar wind breathed to them again. I hope you are comfortable, it said weakly. They nodded. And... I would like to congratulate you on the accuracy of your deductions. Arthur quickly pointed out that he hadn't deduced anything much himself. Trillian was the one. She'd simply asked him along because he was interested in life, the universe and everything. That is something in which I too am interested, breathed Hector. Well, said Arthur... We should have a chat about it sometime, over, over a cup of tea. There slowly materialised in front of them a small wooden table, on which sat a silver teapot, a bone china milk jug, a bone china sugar bowl, and two bone china cups and saucers. Arthur reached forward, but they were just a trick of the light. He leaned back on the sofa, which was an illusion his body was prepared to accept as comfortable. Why, said Trillian, do you feel that you have to destroy the universe? She found it a little difficult talking into nothingness uh, with nothing on which to focus. Hactar obviously noticed this. He chuckled a ghostly chuckle. If it's going to be <laughs> that sort of session, he said, we may as well have the right sort of setting. And now there materialised in front of them something new. It was the dim, hazy image of a couch, a psychiatrist's couch. The leather with which it was upholstered was shiny and sumptuous, but again it was only a trick of the light. Around them, to complete the setting, was the hazy suggestion of wood-panelled walls, and then on the couch appeared the image of Hactar himself. And it was an eye-twisting image. The couch looked normal size for a psychiatrist's couch, about five or six feet long. The computer looked normal size for a black space-born computer satellite, about a thousand miles across. The illusion that sorry, the illusion that were, that the one was sitting on top of the other was the thing which made the eyes twist. All right, said Trillian firmly. She stood up off the sofa. She felt that she was being asked to feel too comfortable and to accept too many illusions. Very good, she said. Can you construct real things too? I mean, solid objects. 
Again there was a pause before the answer, as if the pulverised mind of Hactar had to collect its thoughts from the millions and millions of miles over which it was scattered. Ah, he sighed, you are thinking of the spaceship. Thoughts seemed to drift by them and through them like waves through the ether. Yes, he acknowledged, I can. But it takes enormous effort and time. All I can do in my particle state, you see, is encourage and suggest. Encourage and suggest and suggest. The image of Hactar on the couch seemed to billow and waver, as if finding it hard to maintain itself. It gathered new strength. I can encourage and suggest, it said, tiny species, pieces of space debris, the odd minute meteor, a few molecules here, a few hydrogen atoms there, to move together. I encourage them together. I can tease them into shape. But it takes many eons. So did you make, asked Trillian again, the model of the wrecked spacecraft? Uh, yes, murmured Hactar. I have made a few things. I can move them about. I made... The spacecraft, it seemed best to do so. Something then made Arthur pick up his holdall from where he had left it on the sofa and grasp it tightly. The mist of Hactar's ancient shattered mind swirled about them as if uneasy dreams were moving through it. I repented, you see, it murmured dolefully. I repented of sabotaging my own design for the Silastic Armour Fiends. It was not my place to make such decisions. I was created to fulfil a function, and I failed in it. I negated my own existence. Hactar sighed, and they waited for him to continue his story. You were right, he said at length. I deliberately nurtured the planet of Cricket till they would arrive at the same state of mind as the Celastic Armour Fiends, and require of me the design of the bomb. I failed to make the first time. I wrapped myself around the planet and coddled it. Under the influence of events, I was able to engineer, and influences I was able to generate. They learned to hate light. Maniacs. I had to make them live in the sky. On the ground, my influences were too weak. Without me, of course, when they were locked away from me in the envelope of slow time, their responses became very confused and they were unable to manage. Oh, well, oh, well, he added, I was only trying to fulfil my function. And very gradually, very, very slowly, the images in the cloud began to fade, gently to melt away, and then suddenly they stopped fading There was also the matter of revenge, of course, said Hactar, with a sharpness which was new in his voice. Remember, 
he said, that I was pulverized and then left in a crippled and semi-impotent state for billions of years. I honestly would rather like to wipe out the universe. You would feel the same way, believe me. He paused again as eddies swept through the dust. But primarily, he said, his voice reverting now to its former wistful tone. I was trying to fulfil my function. Oh, well, Trillian said, does it worry you that you have failed? Have I failed? whispered Hactar. The image of the computer on the psychiatrist's couch began to slowly fade again. Oh, well, oh, well, the fading voice intoned again. No, failure doesn't bother me now. You know what we have to do, said Trillian, her voice becoming cold and businesslike. Yes, said Hactar, you're going to disperse me. You're going to destroy my consciousness. Please be my guest. After all these eons, oblivion is all I crave. If I haven't already fulfilled my function, then it's too late now. Thank you, and good night. The sofa vanished, the tea table vanished, the couch and the computer vanished, the walls were gone. Arthur and Trillian made their curious way back into the heart of gold. Well, that, said Arthur, would appear to be that. The flames danced higher in front of him and then subside, subsided. A last few licks and they were gone, leaving him with just a pile of ashes, where a few minutes previously there had been the wooden pillar of nature and spirituality. He scooped them off the hob of the Heart of Gold's Gamma Barbecue and put them in a paper bag and walked back into the bridge. I I think we, we should take them back, he said. I feel that very strongly. He had already had an argument with Slarty Bartfast on this matter, and eventually the old man had got annoyed and left. He'd returned to his own ship, the Bistromath, had a furious row with the waiter, and disappeared off into an entirely subjective area of whatever space was. The argument had arisen because Arthur's idea of returning the ashes to Lord's Cricket Ground at the moment they were originally taking would involve travelling back in time a day or so, and this was precisely the sort of gratuitous and irresponsible mucking about that the campaign for real time was trying to put a stop to. Yes, Arthur had said, but you try and explain that to the MCC, and he would hear no more against the idea. I think, he said again, I think, and stopped. The reason he had started to say it again was because no one had listened to him the first time, and the reason he stopped was because it looked fairly clear that no one was going to listen to him this time either. Ford, Zaphod and Trillian were watching the Vizzy screen intently. Hactar was dispersing under pressure from a vibration field which the heart of gold was pumping into it. "'What did it say?' said Ford. "'I... I thought I heard it say,' said Trillian in a puzzled voice. "'What's done is done. 
I have fulfilled my function. I think we should take these back, said Arthur, holding up the bag containing the ashes, and I feel that very strongly. The sun was shining calmly on a scene of complete havoc. Smoke was still billowing across the burnt grass in the wake of the theft of the ashes by the cricket robots. Through the smoke, people were running, panic-stricken, colliding with each other, tripping over stretchers and being arrested. One policeman was attempting to arrest Wowbagger the Infinitely Prolonged for insulting behaviour, but was unable to prevent the tall grey-green alien from returning to his ship and arrogantly flying away, thus causing even more panic and pandemonium. In the middle of this, for the second time that afternoon, the figures of Arthur Dent and Ford Prefect suddenly materialised. They had teleported down out of the Heart of Gold, which was now in parking orbit round the planet. "'I can explain!' shouted Arthur. "'I have the ashes! They're in this bag!' "'I don't think you have their attention,' said Ford. "'I have also helped save the universe!' called Arthur to anyone who was prepared to listen. In other words, no one. "'That should have been a crowd-stopper!' said Arthur to Ford. It wasn't, said Ford. Arthur accosted a policeman who was running past. Excuse me, he said. The ashes, I've got them. They were stolen by those white robots a moment ago. I've got them in this bag. They were part of the key to the slow time envelope, you see. And, well, any, any well, anyone could guess the rest. The point is, I've got them, and what should I do with them? The policeman told him. But Arthur could only assume... He was speaking metaphorically. He wandered about disconsolately. Is no one interested? he shouted out. A man rushed past him and jogged his elbow. He dropped the paper bag and it spilt its contents all over the ground. Arthur stared down at it with a tight set mouth. Ford looked at him. Want to go now? he said. Arthur heaved a heavy sigh. He looked around at the planet Earth for what he was now certain would be the last time. OK, he said. At that moment, through the clearing smoke, he caught sight of one of the wickets, still standing in spite of everything. Hold on a moment, he said to Ford. When I was a boy, can you tell me later? I had a passion for cricket, you know, but I wasn't very good at it. Or not at all, if you prefer. And I always dreamed, rather stupidly, that one day I would bowl at Lord's. He looked around him at the panic-stricken thong, throng, throng, Wrong. No one was going to mind very much. OK, said Ford wearily. Go on, get it over with. I shall be over there, he added, being bored. He went and sat down on a patch of gently smoking grass. Arthur remembered that on their first visit there that afternoon, the cricket ball had actually landed in his bag. So he looked through it, through his bag. He'd already found the ball in it before he remembered that it wasn't the same bag that he'd had at the time. Still, there the ball was amongst his souvenirs of Greece. He took it out. He polished it against his hip. He spat on it and polished it again. He put the bag down. He was going to do this properly. He tossed the hard red ball from hand to hand, feeling its weight. With a wonderful feeling of lightness and unconcern, he trotted off away from the wicket. A medium-fast pace, he decided, and measured a good, long run-up. He looked up into the sky. The birds were wheeling about it. A few white clouds scudded across it. The air was disturbed with the sound of police and ambulance sirens and people screaming and yelling, but he felt curiously happy and untouched by it all. 
he was going to bowl a ball at Lord's. He turned and poured a couple of times at the ground with his bedroom slippers. He squared his shoulder, tossed the ball in the air again and caught it again. He started to run. As he ran, he saw that standing at the wicket was a batsman. Oh, good, he thought. That should add a little. And then, as his running feet took him nearer, he saw more clearly. The batsman standing ready at the wicket was not one of the English cricket team. He was not one of the Australian cricket team. It was one of the robot cricket team. It was a cold, hard, lethal, white killer robot that presumably had not returned to its ship with the others. Quite a few thoughts collided in Arthur Dent's mind at this moment, but it, he didn't seem to be able to stop running. Time seemed to be going terribly, terribly, terribly slowly, but still he didn't seem to be able to stop running. Moving as if through syrup, he slowly turned his troubled head and looked at his own hand. The hand which was holding the small, hard, red ball. His feet were pounding slowly onwards, unstoppably, as he stared at the ball gripped in his helpless hand. It was emitting a deep red glow and flashing intermittently. And still his feet were pounding inexorably forward. He looked at the cricket robot again, standing implacably still and purposeful in front of him, battle club raised in readiness. Its eyes were burning with a deep, cold, fascinating light, and Arthur could not move his own eyes from them. He seemed to be looking down a tunnel at them, Nothing on either side seemed to exist. Some of the thoughts which were colliding in his mind at this time were these. He felt a hell of a fool. He felt that he should have listened rather more carefully to a number of things he'd heard said, phrases which now pounded round his mind as his feet pounded onwards to the point where he would inevitably release the ball to the cricket robot, who would inevitably strike it. He remembered Hactar saying, Have I failed? Failure doesn't bother me. He remembered the account of Hactar's dying words, What is done is done. I have fulfilled my function. He remembered Hactar saying that he had managed to make a few things. He remembered the sudden movement in his hold all that had made him grip it tightly to himself when he was in the dust cloud. He remembered that he had travelled back in time a couple of days to come to Lord's again. He also remembered that he wasn't a very good bowler. He felt his arm coming around, gripping tightly onto the ball, which he now knew for certain was the supernova bomb that Hactar had built himself and planted on him, the bomb which would cause the universe to come to an abrupt and premature end. He hoped and he prayed that there wasn't an afterlife. Then he realised there was a contradiction involved here and merely hoped that there wasn't an afterlife. He would feel very, very embarrassed meeting everybody. He hoped, he hoped, he hoped that his bowling was as bad as he remembered it to be because that seemed to be the only thing now standing between this moment and universal oblivion. He felt his legs pounding. He felt his arm coming round. He felt his feet connecting with the airline hold-all he'd stupidly left lying on the ground in front of him. He felt himself falling heavily forward, but having his mind so terribly full of other things at this point, he completely forgot about hitting the ground, and didn't. Still holding the ball firmly in his right hand, he soared up into the air, whimpering with surprise. 
He wheeled and whirled through the air, spinning out of control. He twisted down toward the ground, flinging himself hectically through the air, at the same time hurling the bomb harmlessly off into the distance. He hurtled towards the astounded robot from behind. It still had its multifunctional battle club raised, but had suddenly been deprived of anything to hit. With a sudden, mad access of strength, he wrestled the battle club from the grip of the startled robot, executed a dazzling banking turn in the air, hurtled back down in a furious power drive, and with one crazy swing, knocked the robot's head from the robot's shoulders. "'Are you coming now?' said Ford. Epilogue. Almost there. And at the end, they travelled again. There was a time when Arthur Dent would not. He said that the Bistromatic Drive had revealed to him that time and distance were one, that mind and universe were one, that perception and reality were one, and that the more one travelled, the more one stayed in one place, and that with that one thing and another... Sorry, and, and that with that and with... And what with one thing and another, he would rather just stay put for a while and sort it all out in his mind, which was now at one with the universe, so it shouldn't take too long. And he could get a good rest afterwards, put in a little flying practice and learn to cook, which he'd always meant to do. The can of Greek olive oil was now his most prized possession, and he said that the way it had unexpectedly turned up in his life it had again given him a certain sense of the oneness of things, which made him feel that he yawned and fell asleep. In the morning, as they prepared to take him to some quiet and idyllic planet where they wouldn't mind him talking like that, they suddenly picked up a computer-driven distress call and diverted to investigate. A small but apparently undamaged spacecraft of the Meridia class seemed to be dancing a strange little jig through the void. A brief computer scan revealed that the ship was fine, its computer was fine, but that its pilot was half mad. Half mad! Half mad! the man insisted as they carried him raving aboard. He was a journalist with the sidereal daily mentioner. They sedated him and sent Marvin in to keep him company, <laughs> bastards, until he promised to try and talk sense. I was covering a trial, he said at last, on Argabuthon. He pushed himself up onto his thin, wasted shoulders. His eyes stared wildly. His white hair seemed to be waving at someone it knew in the next room. Easy, easy, said Ford. Trillian put a soothing hand on his shoulder. The man sank back down again and stared at the ceiling of the ship's sick bay. The case... The case, he said, it is now immaterial, but there was a witness, a witness, a man, a man called Prack, a strange and difficult man. They were eventually forced to administer a drug to make him tell the truth, a truth drug. His eyes rolled helplessly in his head. <laughs> they gave him too much, he said in a tiny whimper. They gave him much, much too much. He started to cry. I think the robots must have jogged the surgeon's arm. Robots? said Zaphod sharply. What robots? Some some white robots, whispered the man. They broke they broke into the courtroom and stole the judge's scepter, the Argabuthon scepter of justice. Nasty perspex thing. I don't know why they wanted it. He began to cry again. And and I, th I think they jogged the surgeon's arm. He shook his head loosely from side to side, helplessly, sadly, his eyes screwed up in pain. And when the trial continued, he said in a weepering whisper, they asked Prack a most unfortunate thing. They asked him, he paused and shivered, they asked him to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Only, don't you see? He suddenly hoisted himself up onto his elbows again and shouted at them. They'd given him too much of the drug! 
He collapsed again, moaning quietly. Much, too much, too much, too much, too much. The group gathered around his bedside and glanced at each other. They were goose pimples on backs. What happened? said Zaphod at last. Oh, oh, he told it all right, said the man savagely. For all I know, he's still telling it now. Strange, terrible things. Terrible, terrible, he screamed. They tried to calm him, but he struggled to his elbows again. Terrible, incomprehensible things, he shouted. Things that would drive a man mad. He stared wildly at them. Or, in my case, he said, half mad. I'm a journalist. You mean, said Arthur quietly, that you are used to confronting the truth? No, said the man with a puzzled frown. I mean that I made an excuse and left early. He collapsed into a coma from which he recovered only once and briefly. On that one occasion, they discovered from him the following. When it became clear what was happening, and as it became clear that Prack could not be stopped, that here was truth in its absolute and final form, the court was cleared. Not only cleared, it was sealed up, with Prack still in it. Steel walls were erected around it, and, just to be on the safe side, barbed wire, electric fences, crocodile swamps and three major armies were installed, so that no one would ever have to hear Prack speak. That's a pity, said Arthur. I'd like to hear what he had to say. Presumably he would know what the question to the ultimate answer is. It's always bothered me that we never found out. Think of a number, said the computer. Any number. Arthur told the number, the telephone number of the King's Cross Railway Station passenger inquiries on the grounds that it must have some function and that this might turn out to be it. The computer injected the number into the ship's reconstituted improbability drive and... In relativity, matter tells space how to curve, and space tells matter how to move. The heart of gold told space to get knotted, and parked itself neatly within the inner steel perimeter of the Argibuthon Chamber of Law. The courtroom was an austere place. A large, dark chamber, clearly designed for justice rather than, for instance, pleasure. You wouldn't hold a dinner party there, or at least not a successful one. The decor would get all your guests down. The ceilings were high, vaulted, and very dark shadows lurked there with grim determination. The panelling for the walls and benches, the cladding of the heavy pillars, all were carved from the darkest and most severe tree in the most fearsome forest of Argelbard. The massive podium of justice which dominated the centre of the chamber was a monster of gravity. If a sunbeam had ever managed to slink this far into the justice complex of Argabuthon, it would have turned around and slunk straight back out again. Arthur and Trillian were the first in, whilst Ford and Zaphod bravely kept a watch on their rear. At first it seemed to be totally dark and deserted. Their footsteps echoed hollowly around the chamber. This seemed curious. All the defences were still in position and operative around the outside of the building. They'd just run scan checks. Therefore, they had assumed, the truth-telling must still be going on. But there was nothing. Then, as their eyes became accustomed to the darkness, they spotted a dull red glow in a corner, and behind the glow a live shadow. They swung a torch round onto it. Prack was lounging on a bench, smoking a listless cigarette. Huh. Hi, he said, with a little half-wave. His voice echoed through the chamber. He was a little man with scraggy hair. He sat with his shoulders hunched forward, his head and knees kept jiggling. He took a drag of his cigarette. They stared at him. What's going on? said Trillian. Huh. Nothing said the man, and jiggled his shoulders. Arthur shone his torch full on Prack's face. We... we thought... we thought, he said, that you were meant to be telling the truth, the whole truth, and, and nothing but the truth. Oh, yeah, that, said Prack. Yeah, 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 it was. Uh, I finished. There's not nearly as much of it as people imagine. <laughs> Some of it's pretty funny, though. 
He suddenly exploded into three seconds of maniacal laughter and stopped again. He sat there jiggling his head and knees. He dragged on his cigarette with a strange half-smile. Ford and Zaphod came out of the shadows. "'Tell us about it,' said Ford. "'Oh, well, I can't remember any of it now,' said Prack. "'I thought of writing some of it down, but first I couldn't find a pencil, and then I thought, why bother?' There was a long silence, during which they thought they could feel the universe age a little. Prack stared into the torchlight. "'None of it?' said Arthur at last. "'You... you can remember none of it?' No. Oh. <laughs> really? Oh, except most of the good bits were about frogs. <laughs> I remember that. Suddenly he was hooting with laughter again and stamping his feet on the ground. <laughs> you wouldn't believe some of the things about frogs. <laughs> come on, come on, let's go out and find ourselves a frog boy. <laughs> I will always see them in a new light. Oh, I can't tell you that. He leapt to his feet and did a tiny little dance, and then he stopped and took a long drag at his cigarette. <gasps> <clears throat> let's find a frog I can laugh at, he said simply. Anyway, who are you guys? came to find you, said Trillian, deliberately not keeping the disappointment out of her voice. My, my name's Trillian. Prack jiggled his head. Full prefect, said Ford with a shrug. Prack jiggled his head. And I, said Zaphod, when he, sorry, I've got that wrong, full prefect, said full prefect. And I, said Zaphod, when he judged that the silence was once again deep enough to allow an announcement of such gravity to be tossed in lightly, I'm Zephod Beeblebrox. Prack jiggled his head. Hmm. Who's this guy? said Prack, jiggling his shoulder at Arthur, who was standing silent for a moment, lost in disappointed thoughts. Me, said Arthur. Oh, my name's Arthur Dent. Prack's eyes popped out of his head. No! No kidding! he yelped. You! You! Are Arthur Dent! The Arthur Dent! He staggered backwards, clutching his stomach, and convulsed, and convulsed with fresh, fresh paroxysms of laughter. <laughs> he just, uh, <laughs> just think of meeting you! He gasped. Boy, he shouted. You are you. <laughs> you are the most. Wow! <laughs> you just leave the frog standing. He howled and screamed with laughter. He fell over backwards onto the bench. He hollered and yelled in hysterics. He cried with laughter. He kicked his legs in the air. He beat his chest. Gradually he subsided, panting. He looked at them. He looked at Arthur. He fell back again, howling with laughter. Eventually he fell asleep. Arthur stood there with his lips twitching whilst the others carried Prack comatose onto the ship. Always done. Before we picked up Prack, said Arthur, I was going to leave. I still want to, and I think I should do so as soon as possible. The others nodded in silence, a silence which was only slightly undermined by the heavy, muffled and distant sound of hysterical laughter which came drifting from Prack's cabin, at the farthest end of the ship. "'We have questioned him,' continued Arthur, "'or at least you have questioned him. "'I, as you know, can't go near him. "'Well, we've questioned him on everything, "'and he doesn't really seem to have anything to contribute, "'just the occasional snippet, "'and things I really don't want to hear about frogs.' "'The others tried not to smirk. "'Now, I am the first to appreciate a joke,' said Arthur, and then he had to wait for the others to stop laughing. I am the first! He stopped again. This time he stopped and listened to the silence. There actually was a silence this time, and it had come very suddenly. Prack was quiet. For days they had lived with constant maniacal laughter ringing round the ship, only occasionally relieved by short periods of light giggling and sleep. Arthur's very soul was clenched with paranoia. It was not the silence of sleep. A buzzer sounded. A glance at a board told them that the buzzer had not been sounded by Prack. He's not well, said Trillian quietly. The constant laughing is completely wrecking his body. 
Arthur's lips twitched, but he said nothing. We'd better go and see him. Trillian came out of the cabin wearing her serious face. He wants you to go in, she said to Arthur, who was wearing his glum and tight-lipped one. He thrust his hands deep into his dressing-gown pockets and tried to think of something to say which wouldn't sound petty. It seemed terribly unfamiliar, but he couldn't. Please, said Trillian. He shrugged and went in, taking his glum, tight-lipped face with him, despite the reaction this always provoked from Prack. He looked down at his tormentor, who was lying quietly on the bed, ashen and wasted. His breathing was very shallow. Ford and Zaphod were standing by the bed looking awkward. <clears throat> you wanted to ask me something, said Prack in a thin voice and coughed slightly. Just the cough made Arthur stiffen, but it passed and subsided. How do you know that? he asked. Prack shrugged weakly. Because it's true, he said simply. Arthur took the point. Yes, he said, at last in a rather strained drawl. I did have a question, or rather what I actually have is an answer. I wanted to know what the question was. Prack nodded sympathetically, and Arthur relaxed a little. It's, well, it's a long story, he said, but the question I would like to know is the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything. All we know about it is that the answer is 42, which is a little aggravating. Prack nodded again. 42, he said. Yes, that's right. He paused. Shadows of thought and memory crossed his face, like the shadows of clouds crossing the land. I'm afraid, he said at last, that the question... And the answer are mutually exclusive. Knowledge of one logically precludes knowledge of the other. It's impossible that both can ever be known about in the same universe. He paused again. Disappointment crept into Arthur's face and snuggled down into its accustomed place. Except, said Prack, struggling to sort a thought out, if it happened, it seems that the question and the answer would just cancel each other's out and take the universe with them, which would then be replaced by something even more bizarrely inexplicable. It's possible that this has already happened, he added with a weak smile, but there is a certain amount of uncertainty about it. A little giggle brushed through him. Arthur sat down on a stool. Oh, well, he said with resignation. I was just hoping there would be some sort of reason. Do you know, said Prack, the story of the reason? Arthur said that he didn't. Prack said that he knew that he didn't. He told it. One night, he said, a spaceship appeared in the sky of a planet which had never seen one before. The planet was Delphorsus. The ship was this one. It appeared as a brilliant new star moving silently across the heavens. Primitive tribesmen who were sitting huddled on the cold hillsides looked up from their steaming night drinks and pointed with trembling fingers, swearing that they had seen a sign, a sign from their gods, which meant that they must now arise at last and go and slay the evil princes of the plains." In the high turrets of their palaces, the princes of plains looked up and saw the shining star, and received it unmistakably as a sign from their gods that they must go and set about the accursed tribesmen of the cold hillsides. And between them, the dwellers in the forests looked up into the sky and saw the sign of the new star, and saw it with fear and apprehension, for though they had never seen anything like it before, they too knew precisely what it foreshadowed, and they bowed their heads in despair. They knew that when the rains came, it was a sign. When the rains departed, it was a sign. When the winds rose, it was a sign. When the winds fell, it was a sign. 
when in the land there was born at midnight of a full moon a goat with three heads. That was a sign. When in the land there was born at some time in the afternoon a perfectly normal cat or pig with no complications at all, or even just a child with a retrousse nose, that too would often be taken to be a sign. So there was no doubt at all that a new star in the sky was a sign of a particularly spectacular order. And each new sign signified the same thing. That the princes of the plains and the tribesmen of the cold hillside were about to beat the hell out of each other again. This in itself wouldn't be so bad, except that the princes of the plains and the tribesmen of the cold hillsides always elected to beat the hell out of each other in the forest. And it was always the dwellers in the forest who came off worse in these exchanges, though as far as they could see, it never had anything to do with them. Sometimes, after some of the worst of these outrages, the dwellers in the forest would send a messenger to either the leader of the princes of the plains or the leader of the tribesmen of the cold hillsides and demand to know the reason for this intolerable behaviour. And the leader, whichever one it was, would take the messenger aside and explain the reason to him slowly and carefully and with great attention to the considerable detail involved. The terrible thing was, it was a very good one. It was a very clear, very rational and tough. The messenger would hang his head and feel sad and foolish that he had not realised what a tough and complex place the real world was and what difficulties and paradoxes had to be embraced if one was to live in it. Now do you understand? the leader would say. The messenger would nod dumbly. And you see these battles have to take place? Another dumb nod. And why they have to take place in the forest, and why it is in everybody's best interest, the forest dwellers included, that they should. Uh, in the long run, uh, yes. And the messenger did understand the reason, and he returned to his people in the forest. But as he approached them, as he walked through the forest and amongst the trees, he found that all he could remember of the reason was how terribly clear the argument had seemed. What it actually was, he couldn't remember at all. And this, of course, was a great comfort when the next tribesmen and the princes came hanging, hacking and burning their way through the forest, killing every forest dweller on the way. Prack paused in his story and coughed pathetically. I was the messenger he said, after the battles precipitated by the appearance of your ship, which were particularly savage, many of our people died. I thought I could bring the reason back. I went and was told it by the leader of the princes, but on the way back it slipped and melted away in my mind like snow in the sun. That was many years ago, and much has happened since then. He looked up at Arthur and giggled again very gently. There is one other thing I can remember from the truth drug. <laughs> apart from the frogs and that is that God's last message to his creation would you like to hear it? for a moment they didn't know whether to take him seriously or not it's, tr it's true, for real, I, I mean it his chest heaved weakly and he struggled for breath his head lolled slightly I wasn't very impressed with it when I first knew what it was, he said, but now I think back to how impressed I was by the prince's reason and how soon afterwards I couldn't recall it at all, and I think it might be a lot more helpful. Would you like to know what it is, would you? They nodded dumbly. I bet you would. If you're that interested, I suggest you go and look for it. It is written in thirty-foot-high letters of fire on top of the quenchless Quasgar Mountains in the land of Savalbarupstri on the planet of Priliumtan, third out from the sun of Zars in the galactic sector QQ7 active J Gamma. It is guarded by the majestic Vantrashell of Lob. There was a long silence following this announcement, which was finally broken by Arthur. Sorry, it's where? he said. 
<sighs> it is written, repeated Park, in 30-foot-high letters of fire on top of the quenchless Quasgar Mountains in the land of Savabur Upstri on the planet Premium, Premium, Premium Tarn, third out from the... So, so, sorry, uh, said Arthur. Which mountains? The quenchless Quasgar Mountains in the land of Savabur Upstri on the planet... Which land was that? I didn't quite catch that. Savabur Upstri on the planet... Oh, for heaven's sake, said Prack, and died testily. In the following days, Arthur thought a little about this message. But in the end, he decided that he was not going to allow himself to be drawn by it. And instead, on following his original plan of finding a nice little world somewhere to settle down and lead a quiet, retired life. Having saved the universe twice in one day, he thought that he could take things a little easier from now on. They dropped him off on the planet Cricket, which was now, once again, an idyllic pastoral world even if the songs did occasionally get on his nerves. He spent a lot of time flying. He learnt to communicate with birds and discovered that their conversation was actually fantastically boring. It was all to do with wind speed, wing spans, power to weight ratios and a fair bit about berries. Unfortunately, he discovered once you have learnt bird speak, you quickly come to realise that the air is full of it, the whole time, just inane bird chatter. There is no getting away from it. For that reason, Arthur eventually gave up the sport and learnt to live on the ground and love it, despite a lot of the inane chatter he heard down there as well. One day... He was walking through the fields, humming a ravishing tune he'd heard recently, when a silver spaceship descended from the sky and landed directly in front of him. A hatchway opened, a ramp extended, and a tall grey-green alien marched out and approached him. Arthur Philip, it said and then glanced sharply at him and down at his clipboard. He frowned. He looked up at him again. Bollocks! I've done you before, haven't I? he said. And that, ladies and gentlemen,